So the debate between Bill Nye and Ken Ham just dropped, and I wanted to respond to some of the things that I saw really quickly while it's still fresh in my mind. I think Bill Nye did an amazing job of articulating the science of evolution and the evidence for an old earth. I think he made a fantastic point about observed versus historical science. We don't accept when someone says that forensic science can't be trusted because they didn't observe, let's say, a murder. We trust and understand that the natural laws didn't suddenly change between the committing of a murder and the time of trial. I thought that was a fantastic point. We can rely on this evidence. Uh, what reasons do we have to believe that, let's say, uh, radioactive decay has changed over time? What reasons do we have to believe that, let's say, rapid speciation happens across multiple pairs of inbreeding animals just a few thousand years ago after a massive flood? It's not just that we can demonstrate that we can't. It's not just that we can't demonstrate the claims of creationism. It's that we have many reasons to disbelieve these things. And, and this point about astronomy being us directly observing the past, uh, the, even the distant past, I thought was fantastic. And I'm really happy that he also brought up the point of this absurdity of, of plant life surviving a turbulent global flood with water so powerful that they could carve out the Grand Canyon in a few, a few months. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Actually, let's, let's add marine animals to that mix as well. How are they surviving such a turbulent deluge that changes not only the salinity, but also the light filtration and the water pressure of their habitat? Creationists don't often address this. They assume that if... a marine life is outside during a global flood, it'll be okay. Um, no, no, there are serious problems that weren't addressed by Ham, really, with a animal surviving a global flood. And I'm glad that Bill and I really put that point in there. It was great. I also found Ham's appeals to the impressive credentials of some creationists to be a logical fallacy. It's basically an appeal to authority. These scientists may have contributed to science you know, in their fields, and we're all grateful for that, but they didn't contribute to science because they were creationists. Their contributions are valued because they jive with observable reality. Sir Isaac Newton obviously contributed greatly to science. Does that mean that alchemy should be considered a val valid science? I mean, he believed in alchemy. What does that say? And I've mentioned this before, but people like Kurt Wise, right? A prominent creation scientist who has legitimate credentials, even by secular standards, have outright said that they believe, not because of evidence, not because of reason, but primarily because this is what their dogma says. That's something that is antithetical to what true science is, which is about making a hypothesis, making a prediction, and then testing it and demonstrating that it's an accurate prediction or that there's valid reasons to believe them. That is not what Answers in Genesis and Creationist science, science groups like them and the ICR and others are about. They are about promoting dogma. Thank you for bringing that up, Mr. Nye. And, well, he, I, I'm not sure he really pushed it as hard as he could have, but he did at least address the idea of predictions and that true science makes predictions that can be verified. I appreciate that. Bill Nye, I think, also brought up an excellent point about kangaroos getting from the Middle East to Australia. I use the exact same analogy when I discuss with creationists, except I prefer to use koalas, because I, I just like koalas. How is it that a pair of koalas hopped off Noah's Ark in Turkey uh, by Mount Ararat? It's believed that the Ark landed on Mount Ararat. And then these two koalas crawled through the deserts of the, of the Middle East, climbed the mountains of the Indian subcontinent, including the Himalayas, <laughs> that you know swung through the jungles of southeast asia island hopped through the south pacific and then swam the rest of the way to australia without a single eucalyptus tree to support them where is the evidence to show this migration prior to europeans arriving in australia marsupials dominated that continent uh and kenham's from australia so i think this is kind of ironic and there are even fossils to of species of marsupials in australia that represent animals that no longer exist on the earth, suggesting that they were there for a long time. Yes, there are a few exceptions, with some placental mammals like bats, dingoes, and of course the ancient aboriginal humans who brought the dingoes with them to the outback, being in Australia before the arrival of Europeans a few centuries ago, but why aren't there more placental mammals in Australia's fossil record? Surely if a land bridge connected Southeast Asia to Australia just a few thousand years ago, other mammals, not just marsupials, 
would have traveled down under in large numbers. There, there are some egg-laying mammals like echidnas, of course, but where are the placentals? It doesn't make any sense. This is the reason why Australia's ecosystem stands as one of the best arguments against the global flood in the last few thousand years. How could Australia's flora and fauna have developed as uniquely as it did if its ecosystem was disrupted by a worldwide flood so recently? Ken Ham was fundamentally wrong about one of his key statements regarding evidence for the Genesis creation account. He said that if the Bible is true, we'd see one race of humans. The problem, we actually do have evidence for other hominids, other races of human beings, having once shared the earth. And I'm not talking about ethnicities here, I'm talking about other species within our genus. Neanderthals, for example, are a great example of this. There are enough differences between modern Homo sapiens and these other humans that they would actually qualify as other races of people. How does that work with the idea that all humans who ever existed descended from two people a few thousand years ago in a garden? In a garden. It, 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 it doesn't make any sense. Why would that be in the fossil record? Oh, and, and that racism thing that Ken Ham used in the debate and that I predicted he was going to use in the debate because he likes to accuse evolutionary models of bigotry. Uh, not buying it. Not buying it. Let's all remind ourselves that one of the key ways in which biblical literalists of past centuries involved in the slave trade justified themselves was in appealing to a literal Genesis, particularly Genesis chapter 9, in which supposedly, according to that interpretation of Genesis chapter 9, really, really drunk, hungover Noah prophesied slash cursed some of the descendants of his grandson Canaan, son of Ham, yes, the irony strikes hard here, into subservience to his other sons, Shem and Japheth. Biblical literalists to this day believe that Ham was the father of dark-skinned Africans and used that verse to justify enslaving us and even more recently promoting the idea that we were inferior. Henry Morris, who in many ways was the father of modern young earth creationism, was one of these people who held to this idea of a curse of Ham, or a prediction that Ham's descendants would be subservient to those of other Noah's, uh, Noah's other sons, and that we have inherent qualities to us that make us more... Uh, more adept at being servants, let's say. Uh, racial essentialism, essentially. So yeah, Ken kind of doesn't have a leg to stand on here. Belief in literal Genesis creationism doesn't rid the world of racism. Ken Ham's distinction between microevolution, or changes within kind, and so-called macroevolution, which is change from one kind to another, is also an artificial distinction that you will only really see within creationist circles. These ideas of baromans, which are pretty much definition of pseudoscience. All adaptation can be considered evolution or change over time. It is essentially like saying one believes in inches, but not miles, or saying that one believes in seconds and minutes, but not in centuries. One is simply the long version of the other. The question, Mr. Ham, is where do these distinctions between kind actually come from? Exactly how much micro-evolving, quote-unquote, does one of your kinds have to do before it becomes a different kind? The irony, of course, is that creationists actually do believe in a greatly accelerated form of evolution. Look at this image from the Creation Museum. It shows what creationists believe to be a small ancestor of the modern horse becoming the modern genus Equus, which is horses, zebras, donkeys, and so forth. Evolutionary scientists believe this transition happened over about 55 million years. Young Earth creationists claim that this transition happened over a few centuries. How does that work exactly? Little Hierakotherium becoming the modern horse over 55 million years makes sense. Tiny little arc equid, as it's called here, becoming the modern horse, donkeys, zebras, so forth, over a few centuries, maybe a millennia or two, doesn't make any sense. You're just going to impose supernaturalism in there and say that God just magically gave them some ability to hyper-evolve, like Pokemon style? How? I mean... It's the definition of looking at your Bible and saying that, okay, this Bible has to be true, and then trying to fix or trying to shove what we can observe in empirical reality and the fossil record into your beliefs, your already established beliefs. It doesn't work. Ken Ham's appeal to the Hebrew creation story and that specific deity is also problematic. There are literally a multitude of creator deities in various world mythologies, and the accounts of how they created the world tend to vary wildly. Even if we were to come to a solid evidence that the universe requires a designer, it is a non sequitur to assume that this deity has to be the one described in the Bible, that it has to be Yahweh. 
How do we know, Mr. Ham, that the Zoroastrian deity or her Mazda is not responsible or, or the West African deity Olorun or, or the great spirit of the Plains natives of North America? How can we know that? If a creator is required, how do you know that it's specifically the God of your Bible? And that's the thing with creationism. It's not about investigating the truth. It's about supporting or trying to find arguments to shore up already decided upon beliefs. True science is, a, is having a guess or having a hypothesis and then subjecting it to empirical evidence and empirical review rather than taking it on faith. I love nice points about the predictability of science or predictive science. Uh, I think that's completely valid. Creationism does not make predictions that can only be explained by origins involving Yahweh a few thousand years ago in a garden creating dirt people and, and creating magic fruit and forbidding them from eating it. It's, it's really just dogma, straight up. And the fact that I think Ham and others like him are trying to push the idea that this is true science, that this is legitimate science on the same level as, you know, the peer-reviewed, you know, empirically verified science or body of, of knowledge that composes evolution, uh, evolutionary biology, the theory of evolution, it, it's ridiculous. It doesn't work that way. And I'm sorry that so many of the people who were watching the debate, obviously uh, homeschoolers, people who went to private Christian schools like I did, and others, are probably not being exposed to this kind of critical thinking and just kind of critique of their of their beliefs. Hopefully, Nye did some good here by by you know kind of going into the <laughs> the lion's den, if I may use the biblical analogy, and actually exposing them to some real science. One of the small places I think Nye goofed, and again, he did very well, especially compared to Ham's numerous mistakes, is that he used lion's teeth as absolute proof of an animal's diet. While teeth do suggest an animal's diet, there are other things like intestinal length and direction of eyesight and, you know, bite pressure and things like that that make far better evidence for an animal's diet. Also, the question then becomes, for Mr. Ham, why Yahweh would have created animals with features that can only really be explained in a predator-prey context. For example, a shark's ability to sense blood in the water, or some spiders being so venomous, or porcupines having sharp defenses, or even an antelope being just fast enough to evade a cheetah. And while we're on the subject of cheetah, why do cheetah's anatomy seem so specialized for speed when they were originally, quote-unquote, intelligently designed to eat stationary plants? It just seems like a very strange thing that a creator who intended all of his animals to be herbivores would put that in there. And Ken Ham, of course, also made the point about uh, bears being mostly vegetarian. They're omnivorous, so yes, it would make sense that they would have sharp teeth. Though, again, sharp teeth isn't the absolute evidence or proof that an animal is a meat eater. Finally, I think that the point has to be made that when Ken Ham answered the question of what would make him change his mind, he did not really answer the question in a matter consistent with what Answers in Genesis and other creationist organizations actually state in their literature and on their websites. Pretty much every one of us who reads creation mater creationist material, or like me, uh, was raised in an environment where creationism was accepted, we all know that outright answers in genesis the institute for creation research these other organizations outright state that when empirical evidence challenges a literal view of genesis the believer is to disregard or reinterpret that evidence because no matter what genesis has to be true the bible has to be the literal inerrant word of an omniscient omnipotent omnipresent being that it is critical to basically very key christian doctrines like original sin, for example. great uh, That would be the, the big one. This is really important to understanding the creationist worldview and why they fight so strongly against things like the Big Bang and an old earth and evidence for evolution. And I presented the circumstances, circumstances under which he would change his view. Ham and Answers in Genesis won't do that because creationism is not about scientific inquiry. It is about defending dogma. Notice in Answers in Genesis literature and their cartoons and even the part of their museum where they talk about uh, what happens when the world abandons uh, biblical foundations. The emphasis seems to be not on accurately describing the theory of evolution, but defending people, particularly children, from falling away from their faith. Instead of teaching people to pursue truth 
to wherever it leads. The creationist starts with an assumption and then refuses to budge when presented with opposition, no matter how valid. It's basically, this is what we're talking about. Faith, dogma. I The Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. That is, antith that is the antithesis to science, which is about the scientific method, which is about extraordinary claims demanding extraordinary proof. So, yeah, that's pretty much what I wanted to say. I wanted to get that off my chest while it was still, you know, fresh and while I was still had my, my drive about it. But Bill Nye did a very good job. I'm glad that he agreed to this debate. Anyway, thanks for listening, everyone.